Thank you. Before we move to topical questions, I wish to make a short statement. Members will have received a letter this morning from the Clark Chief Executive. The letter highlights a technical problem with the software used to make the random draw for general and portfolio questions, which was identified last week. This has occurred following a software upgrade implemented in March this year. It means that members with some names in the lower half of the alphabet may not have been picked up for inclusion in some of the draws during the intervening period. The problem has occurred in up to 12 of the 27 weeks of business since the software was upgraded. As soon as the problem was identified, steps were taken to rectify the situation. A manual workaround was used for the draw this week, and new software is currently being developed and tested, which will be rolled out for next week's draw or as soon as possible afterwards. The new system will be subject to rigorous testing and it will also be possible to confirm which members' names are included in future draws. This situation is clearly unacceptable, and so apologies are made to those members who have been disadvantaged. Please also be assured that all steps have been taken to avoid this problem occurring in the future. I recognise that members will be disappointed by these events, and I deeply regret it. It is important to rebuild members' confidence so, in addition, I will be asking business managers if they wish to send a representative to see for themselves the draw for next week's questions. We now move to topical questions, which are unaffected by the random picking. Um, question number one, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report by the independent review of primary care out of our services. Cabinet Secretary, Shona the Robertson. The Scottish Government welcomes the report of the National Review of Out of Our Services published on the 30th of November. I want to thank uh, Professor Ritchie for all his hard work in preparing such a wide-ranging and comprehensive report. Given the complex issues involved, we have asked all key delivery partners, including health and social care partnerships, to set out how they propose to deliver the recommendations locally. We'll then use these local plans to inform a detailed national implementation plan, which we will publish in the spring of 2016. To ensure that we see action immediately, I announced £1 million to begin testing the new urgent care hub model recommended in the report. Jenny I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. One of the recommendations involves effective workforce planning and calls for a national primary care workforce plan, something which I and many of my colleagues on these benches have suggested before. Does the Cabinet Secretary now agree with Sir Lewis Ritchie that workforce, pl workforce planning should be taken forward urgently? And what is her timescale for this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, workforce planning is fundamental, it always has been, and of course uh, we accept all the recommendations in the report. Uh, going forward, what I've set out in my initial answer is that the detailed national implementation plan uh, will bring together the, uh, all of the elements of the report in terms of how those will then be implemented by uh, the Scottish Government by uh, boards and partners. Um, I said I would bring that forward in the spring of next year. Meantime, though, what's important is we get on with the uh, elements of the report. For example, the testing of the, urge, the new urgent care hub model is very important, and we want to get on with uh, identifying test sites for that, and uh, we're going to be doing that immediately. Gentlemen. We very much welcome the, the funding that's been put in place, the £1 million for the, the pilot hub uh, testing model. But the Cabinet Secretary will also know that the out-of-hour service across the country is struggling with reports of up to two GPs covering whole regions and real problems in Lanarkshire. The Cabinet Secretary says she's going to bring forward her, how her government will implement uh, recommendations in the spring, but what is she going to do now about the pressure on our, our out of our service in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, I wouldn't have commissioned the out of hours report from Sir Lewis Ritchie had I thought there weren't challenges in the out of hours services. That's why I commissioned uh, him to uh, do this report. The report is excellent. It's, it sets us on the right path 
to transform our out-of-hours services. Of course, there are short, medium and longer term aspects of uh, the report, as Sir Lewis uh, lays out himself. But we will get on with the job of transforming the out-of-hours services. Meantime, though, of course, out-of-hours services form an integral part of the winter plans, and there is £10.7 million uh, for those winter plans to make sure that there is resilience in all of our services, um, and that includes making sure that the out-of-hours services are robust uh, over the winter, um, and, of course, then the transformation uh, will begin and the report on setting out how that will happen will be brought, brought forward in the spring, as I said earlier. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the different terms and conditions being offered by different health boards to GPs providing out of our services. She will know that while some areas are able to provide GPs for the ADOC services, other health boards, such as Ayrshire and Arran, are moving towards providing ADOC services through the welcome services of advanced pra nurse practitioners. How does the Cabinet Secretary view this change in provision and what, if anything, is she doing about it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, one of the proposals within the report is for a national GP performance list for Scotland. And I think that the member uh, has highlighted uh, an issue um, that uh, boards um, are, sometimes, are often competing with each other for the same uh, GPs. That's why that recommendation, along with many others, so important in bringing together the out-of-hour services in a more coherent uh, way that uh, um, stops the position uh, or avoids the position of boards competing with one another. So as we work through the recommendations, uh, we will expect um, boards to look at their own uh, local uh, plans, uh, both in the, the short term in terms of reflecting the recommendations on their existing plans, but then getting on with the job uh, of implementing these recommendations. And I think that will make a big difference to out of our services um, in, across Scotland, including in the, the members' locality. Jim Hume. Yeah, thank you very much. The review points out that people in remote and rural locations are more likely to report negative, negatively about out-of-hours care, plus concern among people living in these areas uh, re a sense of distance from accessing out-of-hours care. With more than 100,000 patients being treated out with their health board uh, in area in 2014, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give to those people living in remote and rural areas that they will have the care they need when they need it and where they need it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, um, Jim Hume talks about people being treated out with the board area, but of course what he's referring to are many people who are treated at centres like the Golden Jubilee Centre, which is a national resource, and I'm sure Jim Hume wouldn't think that was a bad thing for uh, patients uh, in, across Scotland going to that, that centre for excellent treatment. In terms of the remote and rural dimension of the report, um, Sir Lewis spends a, a, a good deal of the report looking at uh, the remote and rural challenges. And as we move forward with the recommendations, particularly how the new urgent care hub model will work, I'm keen to test that both in an urban and in a rural and remote context. Because uh, we, in remote and rural areas, without a doubt, there is a, a reliance on the local assets of the community. First responders have a, a, a very important role there, as does the ambulance service, as well as the uh, primary care out of our services. So I am very keen that we test that, the, this new model in a remote and rural context um, for its application more widely. Thank you, McNeil. Thank you, President Officer. <coughs> uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, I agree that uh, this is a, a, a well worth report, a worthy report. Um, and uh, so, you know, I agree with you that we need to make progress on it. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned the GP contract in, in 2017 and again today uh, the impl implementation plan in 2016. I think one of the highlights of the report um, uh, is that deprived communities are losing out now and could be benefit now. And I'm wondering if uh, implementation of beneficial elements uh, of, of this report could be rolled out prior to these dates um, uh, in deprived neighbourhoods and communities such as uh, Inverclyde? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, Duncan McNeill will be aware that the uh, publication of this report coincided with the publication of some research uh, actually commissioned by the, the Scottish Government, which uh, highlighted some of 
the issues that Duncan Neal is referring to. He will be aware, of course, that within the existing contract, there is an element of funding for deprivation. Uh, the 100 deep end practices receive uh, together around £5.4 million. But as he knows, as I've said before in this chamber, I think we need to go further than that and that the new contract uh, offers the opportunity to do that. Now, we will have a transition year in 2016 with the new contract, with large elements of the COF uh, being dismantled to remove bureaucracy. If there's anything we can move on earlier with that, or indeed um, early aspects of the, uh, the recommendations from Sir Lewis, then I'll certainly look at that and perhaps some of the modelling and the testing uh, we can have a, a focus on testing uh, within the, some of the more deprived communities how this model can work to best effect. Lynn Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given the report and the research, does the Cabinet Secretary think that it would be appropriate for NHS Lanarkshire to go ahead with plans just to provide a centre in the south and not to have a centre at all in the North Lanarkshire area? Well, as I've said before, and there is no change to this, what we would expect um, uh, Lanarkshire to, to do is to look now at the report and apply the, the report to uh, their services. Uh, if uh, the board moves to any permanent change in its out-of-hours uh, provision, because of course it's an interim service that they have at the moment, then that issue would of course come to the Scottish Government but I would expect Lanarkshire and all of the um, other boards to make sure that their services are in line with the recommendations of the report as I've said in this place before. Question two, Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it will take in response to the recent report on Police Scotland by the Interception of Communications Commissioner's Office. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. On learning of the breaches in the summer, the Scottish Government contacted Police Scotland to seek reassurance that they would cooperate fully with the IOCO investigation and that they would take any necessary actions that might result. That reassurance was given and Police Scotland have been working on a robust action plan since July to ensure that there has been no repeat of these incidents and that it cannot happen again in the future. However, it's clear that Police Scotland's actions in accessing communication data have fallen short of the standard expected. And I welcome the announcement last week by the Scottish Police Authority that they would ask HMICS to review the robustness of the procedures around Police Scotland's counter-corruption practices. I can reassure the Chamber that this will be an independent, thorough and in-depth review. In order to provide assurance to the public and this Parliament, it will focus on operational effectiveness and efficiency, the independence of the internal investigation function, governance and accountability, and training and guidance for officers and staff. The review will be submitted to the Scottish Police Authority and laid in Parliament in the spring, and I expect to see any HMICS recommendations for improvements implemented in full. Any breach of acquisition and disclosure of communication data code of practice is unacceptable. A free press is a cornerstone of a healthy democracy and we are committed to protecting the privacy of all law-abiding members of the public, including journalists. Graham Pearson. In his statement on spying in September in this chamber, the Cabinet Secretary said in his own words he had no idea who the police in Scotland are spying on. That's unlike the First Minister. She knew about claims that police had recklessly used illegal surveillance on repeated occasions almost five months ago. It appears that only the public and this Scottish Parliament were kept in the dark. Was the Justice Minister kept in the dark as well? If he wasn't, how does he explain his previous answer to this Parliament? And will, will he now take responsibility, a personal responsibility, to ensure that the numerous failures will not occur in the future in his watch? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, as ever, uh, the member has got a bit confused on these matters because the response I gave at that time to Neil Finlay related to covert surveillance matters, which are entirely different from this particular issue and relate to historical matters as well, which the member will be aware of. So, as ever, the member has been a little confused in these issues. But in relation to this specific point about this matter, when this issue became aware, when we became aware of this in July of this year, we asked Police Scotland for assurances that they were complying with the investigation 
that has been undertaken by IOCO. What's important is that we recognise that IOCO are the responsible, independent, judicially-led body that is responsible for the oversight of this area of policing, not just in Police Scotland, but all police forces across the UK and all public bodies who are able to exercise these powers. What this investigation is actually demonstrated by IOCO is that that oversight mechanism has identified failings in Police Scotland in making sure that it went through the proper process for undertaking this type of acquisition of communication data. And what they also recognise is that Police Scotland have put in place a robust process to make sure that this type of thing can happen again. That's been a thorough process that they have gone through and I recognise that what Police Scotland have done in breaching this code has been unacceptable. But what we have now from IOCO is assurance that they have a procedure in place that can prevent this from happening again in the future. And they will clearly continue to keep that under review as they review the way in which these procedures are used by Police Scotland and every other police force in the UK. Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I accept that IOCO have done their job and done it thoroughly. For years in this Parliament, I have asked the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that proper governance, accountability and oversight was in, in place for the new National Police Force, and that has been rebutted by this Government with some energy. Will we now accept there is not sufficient governance in place and make sure it occurs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, the member seems to be getting himself even more confused on this issue because the governance and oversight of this area of reserve legislation is IOCO. And it was actually put in place by a Labour government in order to make sure that public bodies had the, who had these powers were being held to account. That's exactly what it is there for. Now, I don't know whether the member is suggesting that we should get rid of IOCO. If that is the case, that would be a matter for the UK government to get rid of. IOCO altogether, and it should be replaced by something else. And of course, there is presently the proposal for a new investigative powers <coughs> framework, which could include the emerging of the different inspection regimes and oversight regimes that we have within the UK as well. But the oversight mechanism for this is not something which is peculiar to Police Scotland, which the member would like to give the impression that it is. The oversight mechanism for this is actually one that applies to all police forces in Scotland and is a robust mechanism that has identified failings and have put measures in place. I would have thought, given the member's policing experience, he wouldn't be as confused in this issue as he clearly is. Thank you. I have five members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary. I recognise that time is moving on, but I fully intend to take all of them. But I would be extremely grateful if uh, you would keep your questions as short as possible. Rod Campbell, then Willie Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's perhaps worth uh, noting that the breach of the Code of Practice Concerned is a code that does not relate to the... Can we have Mr Campbell's mic? Thank you, Mr Campbell. Can I just repeat that? It's perhaps worth noting that the breach of the Code of Practice Concerned is a code that does not relate to the interception of communications, nor to the acquisition or disclosure of the contents of communications. So it's a more technical breach. But notwithstanding that uh, and the comments that the Cabinet Secretary has made, how can the public be reassured that the HMICS review will be both vigorous and independent? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member correctly points out, this is to do with the uh, communication uh, data rather than the interception of communications, which has ministerial oversight and requires ministerial authorisation. Uh, the Scottish Police Authority have asked HMICS to undertake a review of the practices being used by Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. And that, as I've mentioned, will be an independent and thorough in-depth review which will look at operational effectiveness and efficiency, the independence of the internal investigation function, governance and accountability and training and guidance, which is provided to staff as well. And that will be uh, laid in palm, which all members will be able to consider. And I would fully expect any recommendations to be fully implemented by Police Scotland. Will Rennie, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Um, what we are still missing from this case is a proper explanation as to who did this and why, we haven't, why they did it also. We did a proper explanation to get the transparency that I think members of the public are seeking, rather than um, it reopening the investigation, they try to find the source of the, the leak. I think we need a proper explanation as to why that was allowed to happen. Cabinet when does he think it will come? Cabinet Secretary. 
So part of the process now will be, is it, given that uh, these breaches have been identified and that IOCO have now written to those individuals who have been affected by it to make them informed that they can now take the matter to an investigatory powers tribunal, they will be responsible for looking at the extent of what that breach implied for that individual and also whether there's any recourse that should be applied in those instances. So the tribunal will now be able to look at the extent of that and to consider how that's impacted on the individuals who have been affected by this. But the member is right. It's important the public can have assurance and that we all have assurance on how these procedures have been implemented. So IOCO have accepted the action plan which has been taken forward by Police Scotland to prevent this from happening again in the future. They will continue to have oversight of that and the independent or the, the, the investigative powers tribunal will now be responsible for deciding on the extent of the breach and how it applied to that individual circumstances and any uh, compensation or other matters that should be applied as a result of that breach. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While I accept that the interception of the communication is reserved, does the Cabinet Secretary share my despondency that the SPA, despite being responsible for the oversight of full Police Scotland full stop, has yet again been caught in the back foot and reduced to admonishing Police Scotland after the fact and then asking HMICS to undertake an insurance review? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's important to understand the process that the investigative powers legislation puts in place and the oversight function for the use of investigative powers is a matter for IOCO in this type of issue. It is not a matter for some other third party body such as the Scottish Police Authority. Now, what is extremely important is that when an organisation like IOCO identify a breach in those procedures that the SPA consider what measures should be taken in order to address any deficiencies. IOCO have confirmed that robust measures have been put in place to address these, uh, these uh, failings in Police Scotland in this particular instance. What HMICS will now do at the request of the SPA is to look at the practices and the wider issues within the practices within the Counter Corruption Unit. That's exactly the area that is the responsibility of the SPA and by actually undertaking this assurance review it will look at the wider issues around it. It will not take over the function that IOCO have in oversight of these which then reports to the Prime Minister on these issues for all forces across the UK. Neil Finlay followed by John Finney. Public concern here is much wider than communications. The last time I asked the Cabinet Secretary whether undercover officers were spying on activists, he said, and I quote, I have no idea. Given the revelations in the Sunday Herald over the last two weekends, will the Cabinet Secretary now uh, instruct a full independent inquiry into the role of undercover policing, undercover policing in Scotland? Or are Scots the only people in the mainland UK who are going to be denied information and justice on what is an extremely important issue? Cabinet Secretary. Well, this is actually a different matter altogether uh, in relation to this matter. And I know that the Labour bench is maybe a bit confused on that particular issue. Uh, but as I made clear, the issues of covert surveillance are not matters which Scottish Government ministers are involved in. Additionally, the issues which a member has raised relate to matters involving Metropolitan Police officers and the work that they were undertaking in direction through the Metropolitan Police officers. As I've said to the member, if he has clear evidence of officers within Police Scotland or any of the legacy forces that he believes were not fulfilling the procedures set out for the use of covert surveillance, then I'm more than happy to consider these issues. As yet, I have still not received any concrete evidence from the, man, the member setting out clearly where there have been breaches relating to specific officers in Police Scotland or in the legacy forces. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Police Authority is the disciplinary authority for Chief Officer ranks in Scotland. I welcome their inquiry. I do not doubt the impartiality of HMCIS. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can tell us what status that would have in respect of discipline. Now, also, in relation to Police Scotland, the disciplinary authority for ranks below Chief Officer is the Deputy Chief Constable. I wonder if there, he feels there is any conflict of interest there, if indeed there is a misconduct inquiry underway, if indeed there is a criminal inquiry underway in relation to these matters. I think the member raises a number of interesting points. That is part of the reason for the HMICS review of the way in which the Counter Corruption Unit have actually been operating some of the practices about accountability and also about the uh, uh, oversight of their mechanisms as well, which could pick up on some of the points that the member has also highlighted. 
Having said that, given that this matter will now also go to an investigatory power tribunal, which will consider the extent of the impact it's had on the individuals concerned for those who choose to take it to a tribunal, and also uh, to those who, uh, would you call uh, any, any, uh, any compensation that should be provided to these individuals. Once that process is being completed, I would expect the SPA and Police Scotland to consider whether there are any further actions that would then be necessary. But given there is due process now in place, and we know that one party who has been affected has already indicated that they would wish to take it to an IPT, then we need to make sure that that process is being completed and fully investigated before any further decisions could then be taken on disciplinary matters. But I do think the member has raised a number of important points, which I have no doubt HMICS will also consider in their investigation. Thank you. That ends topical questions. Point of order, Mr Findlay. Uh, under the standing orders, I wonder if the Minister would like to... Uh, can we have Mr Finlay's mic on, please? Thank Under you. Under the standing orders, I wonder if the Minister would like to correct the record. And that over a week ago, uh, ten members of this Parliament uh, wrote to the Minister raising specific concerns about the activities of undercover police in Scotland. Uh, the Minister, maybe his civil servants haven't advised them of that yet, but that has happened. Secondly, any uh, uh, undercover operations in Scotland have to be authorised by senior officers in the force area in which they are operating. I would have thought the Minister would have known that. As the Member knows, that is not a point of order for me. Uh, what the Minister says is entirely a matter for him. We are now moving to the next item of business, which is a point of order from John Mason. A presiding officer, on the 4th of November, I wrote to you about <coughs> the abuse of points of order by Mr Finlay. And you wrote back to me on the 18th of November but it seems to me that if one member continues to abuse the system like this, then it just encourages all other members to do the same unless some action is taken against them. Can I say, Mr Mason, that is not a point of order. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 15003 in the name of Maureen Watt on the health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. and care Scotland bill. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now.